as you're taking your seats. I hope your Bibles are still open to John chapter 20. And we'll read uh, in, in just toward the end of the message this morning, the remaining section of this chapter. And when we think about the Bible, we are thinking about the book that has one grand story, one main narrative, and that is God's purpose to rescue sinners, sinners like me, sinners like you. His grand story of, of Scripture, the grand narrative, is God's intention to give us rescue, to save us from our brokenness and our ruin. The Bible teaches that God spoke the world into existence. He created all that there is, including humanity. The first person that God created, the first couple, Adam and Eve, had everything they needed, everything they needed for fulfillment and happiness and pleasure. And yet they chose together to walk away from all that God had entrusted them with, all the good, all the meaning, all the purpose, they chose to turn away from God in their sinful rebellion. The Bible teaches us that because of that one sin, the sin of Adam, that condemnation and judgment was passed upon all of humanity. So that as we read later in the Bible, beyond the book of John, in one of Paul's letters, the whole world stands under condemnation. The whole world is justly guilty before a holy God. And yet the narrative of the Bible, the grand story, is that God would not leave sinners, us, you and me, in this wretched, broken condition. God came on a rescue mission in the person of his son, his only son that he sent into the world. Jesus came and live the life that none of us will ever live, could live, have lived. He lived the perfect life. He lived a life without sin. And not only did he live a sinless, perfect life, but he suffered and died in the place of sinners. He was put on a cross where he shed his blood and gave his life in torturous, agonizing pain his blood-soaked body was taken down from that cross. It was laid in a tomb. And three days later, as we sung a moment ago, his buried body began to breathe. And he stepped out of that tomb, out of death, into life. And for all who will look to him, all who will turn from self and sin and trust in Jesus' work on the cross... He provides, he gives forgiveness of all sins, past, present, future. He gives the promise of life everlasting. That's an invitation that he extends to the whole world. That's an invitation that is for every person who will come to him in repentance and faith. And so, even as we consider this chapter... As with the other chapters of the Bible, John chapter 20 calls for a response. The, the narrative of the gospel, the good news that I've just talked about, calls for us to make a response. So you cannot be neutral in the face of the cross, in the face of an empty tomb. And so this morning, at the end of this service, I'm going to extend to you an opportunity, an invitation to make a decision for Jesus Christ. That decision won't be the same for everyone, but I dare say there's very few of us, if any, that does not need to make some kind of a, of a response to this grand story. Today our focus, as you've heard and see, is in John chapter 20. John 20 tells how the resurrection of Christ impacted the lives of four individuals in one group. So you see on the screen those individuals, and they're in our text. Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, John, who is referred to in this text as the other disciple, and Thomas. And then the group, of course, is the apostles as they gathered 
after Jesus' crucifixion. So I'm just simply going to walk through these names. I'm going to make a connecting statement or a summary statement about each of the names. And I think that in many ways we'll see ourselves in these names, in these personalities, in their life experience on that resurrection morning. The first one is Mary Magdalene. I would describe her life in these short words, from sadness to joy. From sadness to joy. We know from other gospel writers, and there's no way we can put all of the, if this were a a lengthy Bible study, we could do this. We cannot put the, the complete narrative of Jesus' resurrection We can't see what all the gospel writers said. We can't read everything Matthew, Mark, and Luke said. We're we're looking at John's view of it. We're looking at what he wrote years beyond the event under the inspiration that is being led, being guided by God to record the very words of Scripture that we would need, that the ages would look to. We're reading John's account. So, for instance, we read in verse 1, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. But if we were able to look at all of the narratives of this account, we would know that Mary was not alone. There were other women who came with her. John chose to report only about Mary Magdalene. And we see that, according to the text, that she was the first to approach the tomb. Now, again, others are traveling with her. Other ladies are making this trek to the the garden tomb to finish the anointing of the body and to complete the burial exercises of the Lord Jesus. She's coming fully expecting to find a body in a grave. She saw where he was buried. She was one of the last to leave the cross And she was one of the first, if not the first, to arrive at the tomb. As she comes there, she assumes that the body will be there. But we read that it's still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She had seen that stone rolled into place. She knew it was secured. We know from the other accounts of the Gospels that there was some conversation as they hastily made their way that resurrection morning. Who's going to move the stone? Perhaps they didn't even consider that in their devotion to the Lord Jesus and their desire to get there. It was kind of like an afterthought. Oh no, who's going to get this big stone out of our way? But John tells us simply that she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And she drew only one conclusion Grave robberies were common in that day, and it was her conclusion that someone had come and taken the body. And so we read that she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that being John. And I would take it that they're together, that these two are at at least are together, or at least in very close proximity. And so she comes with the news that the only conclusion she could make They've taken away his body. You see that in the end of verse 2. And she does not know where they have laid him. And so Peter and John run to the tomb and Mary followed behind. She arrives probably about the time they've done their investigation and they are leaving. We'll pick up with more of Peter and John in just a moment. But if you look in this chapter and drop down to verse number 11, again, this was read a moment ago, but she, after likely the departure of Peter and John, she's left there what she believes by herself, and she's weeping. At this point, the darkness has faded into daylight, or at least the the early uh, rising of the sun Her eyes are filled with tears, and she now stooped to look into the tomb. She had seen that the stone was gone, but now she's she's going to make her own assessments. And so she 
I believe, very, very sad, very troubled, looks into that tomb. And John, again, writing years later, tells what she didn't know then. John tells us that she saw two angels. She, she did not know these were angels. John says she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And she hears the question, woman, why are you weeping? This is really a mild rebuke. This is a time for celebration, a time for joy. This is a time for happiness. Why are you weeping? Well, she's weeping because she does not know what they know. John's, again, giving his account. He's telling as as if it was happening then. And so, apparently, she may, at this point, have been a woman of some financial means. Can't clearly prove that. But when she is concerned about the missing body of the Lord... And she answers them, they've taken away my Lord. I do not know where they've laid him. She she wants to do something about the missing body of Jesus. She wants to give a proper burial. And so there's another being in that cemetery. She does not initially see this person. But we read that she turned and she saw Jesus standing. She did not know it was Jesus Again, this is John, years later, telling the story. All she knows is someone is there. And as darkness is giving way to light, her eyes are puddling tears. And she's trying to compose herself and and control herself just to this person that she sees that she believes is a caretaker of this cemetery She addresses him, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. I will take care of a proper burial. And it's then that Jesus called her name. We know earlier from John's gospel in chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Those who belong to Jesus hear his voice, and His voice echoed in that cemetery. He just simply said her name, and she turned, and she calls him Rabboni, which means teacher. And then she clings to him. She likely fell at his feet. She grabbed him by the, likely by the ankles. Maybe she's holding on to just his feet. And Jesus sends her away. He's grateful for her worship, but he says, do not cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending. This is forthcoming. He's not literally in that moment ascending. There's going to be a moment 40 days later that he literally will ascend, but the process is beginning. He's moving toward that moment. I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So Mary went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Now we know from Mark, we know also from Luke that they thought that she was giving an idle tale. They reported as nonsense, or the gospel writers say it was nonsense. John doesn't tell us everything, only we see here that she went and said, I've seen the Lord. And then he said these things to her. One would think they would have shouted in joy, but not yet. We wonder why they didn't remember that Jesus had told them that the Son of Man is going up to Jerusalem. And he'll be crucified, and on the third day he will rise. He said that more than once. But for whatever reason, they did not understand it. Let's don't judge them too harshly. For many of us have walked with the Lord for a long time. We know a lot of Bible verses. We've heard a lot of sermons and a lot of lessons. And we've read a lot of books. And and we know there's things the Lord has said that we've missed. We know there's mistakes that we've made. Sinful blunders that we've fallen into. Time without number. And so, lest we judge them for not remembering. All we can say from the scripture is 
that they didn't remember. It was just too good to be true. I would remind you that in Mary's case, if you look back again, how she's clinging to Jesus, she's overjoyed that her, her love for the Lord Jesus was so intense. Her love and joy was so overwhelming because sometime earlier she had had an amazing encounter with Jesus. Before the cross, obviously before the resurrection, we know from Luke chapter 8 verse 2 that she was one from whom the Lord Jesus had cast out seven demons. Here was a woman who was demon-possessed. Here was a woman whose life was wrecked. The Bible doesn't describe what her demon possession exactly, explicitly looked like. But every place in the Gospels where we see demon possession, we see a wrecked life. We see chaos. We see a train wreck. And so whatever was going on in her life, we don't know, but we do know that she was under the control of, of demons and Jesus casts those demons out so obviously now this one that she loved now that he's risen her her intense joy cannot be missed her overwhelming devotion cannot be missed but let's let's press on and look at Peter and I would describe Peter with this short statement from resignation to observation the last time we read about Peter before chapter 20 is in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. Do you remember what was going on in Peter's life in that moment? Well, Peter was denying Jesus. If we look at all the accounts of the Gospels, not only was he denying him, he was cursing. And on three different occasions, Peter said, I don't know him. I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. He did the very thing Jesus said he was going to do. He denied him. And friends, if we're honest, we've had our moments where we've denied the Lord Jesus. Maybe for some, it was a life so broken, so messed up before you knew Jesus that the course of your life, the direction of your life was a daily denial that there's a Savior. But maybe there are some of us that even in our post-conversion experience, there were moments that we, we went off the rails or there was times that we did not walk closely with Jesus. Maybe there was a period of brokenness in your life, a period where it's dark and it's ugly and it's messy. And in effect, we were living in denial of the Lord Jesus. And if that's not a part of your testimony and Hopefully that it's not, but if that's not a part of your testimony, I can assure you that every one of us have had moments that we could speak up for Jesus. Moments that we could have been a, a verbal witness. Moments that we could have stood up for our Christian values. And we were silent and we were living in denial of Jesus. And so, Peter, I suspect these past days since Jesus died on that cross, there was this overwhelming sense of resignation I've blown it I've messed up beyond recovery I did the very thing he said I would do I've denied him but here he is we read it you heard it read here he is at the tomb that morning and I think of Peter like a, a police officer who's on a, a crime scene and when John arrived he looked but he didn't go in Maybe it was out of deference to Peter, who was coming later. But Peter just goes straight in. You see it in verse number 6. He went into the tomb. And it's not like he just walked in and came out. But there's this picture of, of Peter looking things over. He's drawing conclusions. Again, I think of like a detective, a police officer on a on a crime scene, making notes, making observations. He notices that the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths. So perhaps he's concluding this could not have been a grave robbery because no grave robbers would take the time to 
take all of the strips that would, in that day, the custom of burial would be to, to wrap cloth around from the armpits to the ankles. No one would, would take the time to get all that off. No, no one could have moved this stone, gotten past the guards and accomplished that. But then his observation goes further and not only is that linen cloth that would have covered the face off to the side, but it's, it's as if it's been neatly folded, like, like when the clothing comes out of the dryer and some things we hang up and some things we, we fold. And so he notices that it's, that it's folded and it's in a place by itself. Peter knew something's up. Grave robbers had not done this. Now, I don't believe at this point he's ready to say, he's ready to, 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 as it were, make a declaration. But he's got a hunch something's up. Something's going on here. The body could not have been taken. And I, I just have to wonder, and I hope I'm using some semblance of sanctified imagination that the thought had to run through his head could this be? Is he alive? And if he is, will he forgive me? And I wonder if some this morning, maybe you'd say, I've never done anything like that. I've never denied Jesus right practically in front of him. I've never lived that kind of a life. But I wonder if there's something in your journey so far that you you live with a lot of guilt and shame over. And you, you, you ask, will he forgive me? Maybe I speak to a Christian and there's, again, that dark episode in your life, that time that you were not walking in the light and, and, and you've never really understood that wonderful biblical teaching called justification. You, you don't really fully grasp forgiveness. You can sing about it. You, you might even be able to teach a Bible study on it. You might know Bible verses on it. But you don't deeply believe it for yourself. That God cleanses you. That he makes your, your past record just as it were in his sight obliterated. That he does a deep cleansing. So I wonder if those thoughts were running through Peter's mind. That would he forgive me? I think Peter perhaps is beginning to wonder that although his terrible was failure, maybe it wouldn't be final. And friends, please don't miss this. If there's a failure in your journey, know that while sin can bring consequences and often does bring terrible consequences, we're here today to worship a Savior who has overcome death and sin. And sin can be forgiven. He will forgive it. But let me press on and look at another person in this narrative, and that's John. And I would describe John as moving from hesitation to believing. Of course, we just read, looking in your Bibles, back in verse number 8, that when uh, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and believed, but he didn't go at first. The other disciple is John, and again, why he hesitated, was it out of respect for Peter, was it he was out of breath, maybe he, he was too stunned, too shocked, the Bible doesn't tell us, so we, we, we can't draw definite conclusions where the Bible is silent, but for whatever reason, there's, there's a hesitation. I do not think that in that moment, when, when we read in John chapter 8 that he also went in and believed, I do not believe that means he became a Christian. I don't think this was the moment that John believed, in, as it were, for salvation. Nor do I take it to mean that John believed the body was gone. I, I think he's already convinced of that. The stone is moved. There's a missing body. The greatest evidence that we, we can look to, or at least one of the greatest evidence for the resurrection, is there's an empty grave. And so, when I read verse number 8, that he saw and believed, 
I take that to mean that in this moment, although it's not explicitly stated that he begins to have this settled in his heart, this is what's really happened. Jesus has risen. He really is alive. We read in the scripture in verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They didn't even have the scripture. There was no Bible to pick up. There was no text that they could. We, we have centuries of Bible translations. We have the Bible in our hands, but he couldn't reach in his cloak and get out his Gideon's New Testament and, and read about this. So he's going by what he believes in this moment, and what he believes is that Jesus has risen. From John, let's press on to the disciples as a group. And I would describe them as moving from fear to empowered. Just thinking of the briefest, shortest words I could give, from, from fear to empowered. The text was read earlier, beginning in verse number 19, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, Sunday. That's why we gather on Sundays. This is the first day of the week, the day that our Lord Jesus rose from the grave. And as John records this, he writes of their fear. The doors were locked. These were marked men. They had walked around with Jesus. They had been present. The Jews, the Roman authorities who had carried out the execution of Jesus, the Romans didn't invent crucifixion, but they perfected it. And they had seen the Lord Jesus tortured and brutally executed on a cross. And so perhaps they were certain this is next for us. We are marked men. And so they're behind locked doors for fear of the Jews but Jesus just appears. He's now in a resurrection body. His body is recognizable, but it's a different body. It has a different quality now. And time would not permit to see this in 1 Corinthians 15, but those locked doors were no obstacle for the Lord Jesus. He simply appears in their midst. And his first words, Shalom. Peace be with you. They needed that. They needed to know peace. Not only were they scared to death, but they were also mindful that they themselves had walked away from Jesus. Peter wasn't the only one that denied Jesus. They themselves, Mark 14, 50, if you want to jot a verse down, they too had forsaken him and fled. So here's a whole group of people that had walked away from Jesus. But what are his first words? They're not losers. Now, that's not what he says. It's not deserters. His first word is peace. Peace be with you. And friends, I just want to give you this encouragement. If there's something in your life that you look at and say, this is, but for this this period, this episode, this one bad decision, my life is in, is just carnage. There's just no recovery from this. These are men that Jesus had poured himself into for three years. And in the most critical moment, they ran, they fled. But Jesus appears to them and he says, peace. But not only does he say peace to them, he commissions them. He gives them an assignment. He says, I'm sending you as the Father sent me. I am sending you. He's, he's sending them forth. And these men would soon, soon become the heralds of this good news of the resurrection. Well, let me give you Thomas now, or let's let the Bible give us Thomas. And I'll read the text at this point. This is beginning in verse 24 of John 20. Now, Thomas... One of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, 
and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. It's a very strong statement. It's like, guys, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think you've seen or experienced. You may be duped by some account of Jesus being alive, but unless I can touch those nail prints, unless I can thrust my hand into that riven side, I'll never believe this. And so eight days later, a week later, plus a day, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And it's as if the Lord Jesus knew exactly what he said, and indeed he did. And he knows what you say and what I say and what you think and what I think. He knew his thoughts. He knew what he had said. So once again, Jesus appears as these doors are locking out everyone else. Jesus just just appears. That would just have to shake them up, would it not? I mean... If someone suddenly, you, someone just suddenly standing right here beside me, a lot of us might just faint right out. I mean, we, we didn't see him come in a door. He just is there. And so Jesus appears, knowing everything Thomas had said and thought. And so he says to him, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Well, Thomas doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do a physical exam, a physical touch. But what he does do is make the greatest declaration of the deity of Christ anywhere to be found in the New Testament. He says it in verse 29, my Lord and my God. He's declaring that Jesus is deity. And friends, if you've never known that, if you think that that Jesus is just a story, just a myth, Jesus is the divine son of God. He is God in the flesh. He is the God to whom we will all give an account one day. And Thomas, what Peter and John had begun to see, now Thomas, who's often called Doubting Thomas, makes the strongest affirmation of faith anywhere to be found. And so Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So we've looked at Mary and Peter and John, the disciples as a group. We've looked at Thomas, who's now with these disciples. But there's one other individual that we must touch on, and that is us. That is me. That is you. We don't see our name in this story, but this story is about our God and how our God wants to reconcile us to himself, how he wants us as Christians to walk with him, to experience him, to joyfully know him. And so as Mary and Peter and John and the disciples and Thomas came from different places and different experiences, we need to come to this same place where we ask the question, what effect has the resurrection had on you? You ask that of yourself. Maybe you say, this is just a bunch of hocus pocus. This, the guy standing up there, he, he just gets paid to, to get up there and talk about this. Maybe you're, you're like this, Thomas. You say, I, I, I'll never believe this. I'm not sure where we all are. But I would ask, has this truth impacted your life? Think about the people in the, in the account. For Mary Magdalene, does the resurrection of Jesus cause you to have a growing sense of joy? I particularly want to ask that of Christians in the room. Some of us are more inclined to more of a melancholic kind of disposition. For some of us, we may have to fight harder for joy. But does the resurrection of Jesus give you any hope? It should. It should give you all the hope in the world. And we should strive to become more like Mary, clinging to Jesus, 
Oh, he's the one that rescued me. He's the one that saved me. I want to stay with him. I don't want him to leave. Or maybe you're like Simon Peter and, and you, you just need to take the time to examine the evidence. You're a skeptic. You're a doubter about this whole thing of Christianity. I would just urge you to take a look at the evidence of the resurrection. If you don't consider anything else from an apologetic standpoint, just study an empty, vacated tomb. There is no plausible explanation when all of the facts are put together than resurrection. There's no, it's been many times over by people in the medical profession, legal profession, the business world. Countless people have set out, even attorneys have set out to write books in, in which they would deny that this is a reality and have come to discover based on the evidence. And that's what attorneys do, right? They look at what they can gather and, and they build a case. And so the evidence is overwhelming. And maybe like Peter, you need to believe that Jesus can restore you and use your life for good purposes. Oh, friend, it, I, I'm just telling you, it weighs heavy on my heart this morning. If there's a man, a woman, a teenager, a person in this room that feels like you, you've just, you, your mess up, your mess was so bad that you didn't just step in it, you did a face plan in it. And, and, and it's just like everybody sees it, everybody knows it, and you can never know cleansing. Hear this good news of the Bible that Jesus will forgive and restore. And you're going to see that, Lord willing, next Sunday in the life of Simon Peter. And consider John. Unlike John, who didn't have the completed revelation of Scripture, you do. How much time do you give to Scripture? What priority do you place on God's Word in your life? How, how important is it to you? How important is gathering with the church? Can I plead with you to make this a, a priority? Read the Bible and gather with the church on Sunday. Read the Bible, gather with the church. There are so many practices of the Christian life that are important, but I'm telling you, those two those two, reading the Bible regularly, gathering with the church where we sing together, we witness baptisms, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we hear prayers, we hear scripture and the teaching of the word. Those two alone will make a difference in your life. Brothers and sisters, that commission that Jesus gave, let's don't forget that that is applicable to us. Look again in verse number 21. Where Jesus said, as the Father sent me, even so I'm sending you. May I just remind you that as we sit in this room of the world's roughly 8 billion now, 8 billion people, nearly 4 billion have no knowledge of the resurrection story. It is as foreign to them as anything in the world. Imagine that. Three and a half to four billion people have never heard the resurrection story. Say, well, I hope the missionaries get it done. Well, some of those people you'll go to work with in the morning. Now, to be honest, many of those people have heard, but it's never made a difference in their life. It's just a story. It, it, it's like I, I heard uh, one of the the news commentators on Fox News that partially had it right, talking about the resurrection, but the resurrection was couched in the terms that, that Jesus rose from the dead to save us all. So the fact that Jesus died and rose again, the world saved. And, and I give him credit for trying to make the point, but people aren't saved until they believe, until they repent and trust in Jesus. And so you rub shoulders with people every day who need to know this good news. Carl Henry nailed it. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. My friends, in the case of Thomas, maybe you're a doubter. 
Maybe you just need to hear this blessed beatitude. We, the beatitudes are not only in Matthew chapter 5. We, we see part of it here in verse 29 where Jesus said, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. That's almost everyone that's never seen a resurrected body. But we believe it. And Jesus said, you're blessed because you believe. Let me give you 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. It's on the screen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Keep believing, friends. You've never believed or you've never seen, but you believe. Keep believing. When the world is dragging you down, keep believing. To anyone listening this morning who has never believed, this is the good news. Jesus died and he rose again. This is the news that your sins can be forgiven because Jesus overcame sin, death, hell, and the grave. So it's good news. Mary's the question, why are you weeping? This is not a time for weeping. It's a time for dancing and celebration. Jesus is alive. And this Jesus can save anyone, anywhere, anytime that will look to him and trust in him. And so our closing hymn this morning is to remind us as believers of the hope, the promise of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But it's also a time for reflection and examination. Now, I told you I would tell you how to respond, so here's how. After we sing, we're going to all sing in just a moment, and after we sing, you may just need general information about the church. You just may have questions about this church. I want to invite you to come to your right, my left. There will be two people, a man and a woman at this table, and they're, they're ready to help you. They, they're ready to listen. They want to encourage you. They're, if you need questions, you have questions about the church, I'm going to encourage you to step, make your way there. Maybe you just need prayer. You just some, Something's going on in your life, and, and you just need to share it. You want someone to pray with you. They would love to do that. Please make your way over there. They're not going to probe and try to pull things, things out of you that you don't want to talk about. Maybe it's just you don't even know how to express it. You just need prayer. They, they would love to pray with you. Maybe you'd like to talk to someone about becoming a Christian. You, you're not yet saved. You're lost. You're cut off from God. And yet God loves you and Jesus died to save you. And you want to you, you begin a conversation. How do I become a Christian? Maybe you've got questions from things I've said and and you just want to press into that. Or you want to renew your relationship with the Lord. Maybe some are thinking back to your childhood or your youth. When you were walking with the Lord. And now you're walking a, a guilty distance from Him. And you just want to renew that relationship with Him. Maybe like a young lady came this morning. And you, just, you have questions about baptism. You've never been baptized. And you, you want to know is this young wife came and expressed her desire to follow Jesus in believer's baptism. And you've never confessed your faith publicly. She knew that. She said it. I, I've never publicly confessed that I'm a Christian and I want to do that. Please make your way to the table. Maybe you'd just like some information about the upcoming Faith for Exiles class that you've been hearing about. Make your way to the table if you'd like to do that. Get some information. Again, I urge you, next steps table right here as soon as the service concludes. Please join me as I pray. And then after I pray, we'll all stand and we'll sing this truth that I've been preaching about. Now, Father, how grateful we are that you sent Jesus and raised him from the dead. What a glorious truth it is. I thank you personally that my life was impacted as a teenage boy. I thank you that you altered my life. And even as a young man, you begin to radically bring about changes and bring about new desires in my heart. 
And Lord, you, I'm, I'm just grateful beyond words that you've been at work patient, mercifully patient with me through these years. I pray for anyone today who's in need of you, Jesus, as their Savior, that you would just break through their heart and their eyesight, the scales that cover them from seeing the cross and the empty tomb, and just save them, God. Just radically save them today. God, for some that just need to be honest and say, I'm, I'm not walking with the Lord, I've, I've drifted. May they go to a brother and a sister that just cares and loves and wants to help and encourage. If there are doubters, if there are skeptics, if there are people that just need to renew or, or make other decisions, give them courage to do so. And Father, I pray for the church, I pray for believers that as we stand and sing about your resurrection, your, your suffering, your death, you're absorbing the punishment we deserved. Oh, Lord, may we sing it for all it's worth. In Jesus' name, amen.